Hello again, everyone. And for those of you who may have just joined us, welcome to this year's Securities Finance Technology Symposium. Um, I'm pleased now to introduce our very first session of the day on SFTR, a topic that was very much a big part of my life when I was at ISLA. And for what I can see now, the industry seems to have done a tremendous job of implementing SFTR. But if anyone saw the article by Richard Camotto, I think that was in Justin's publication recently, entitled SFTR Peering Through the Mist, it doesn't seem like the policymakers have done so well at creating the sort of transparency yet that they, they would like to see. Um, maybe not so much peering through the mist, but peering through the fog and should have, should have gone to Specsavers maybe. Anyway, I'm sure our panel is going to enlighten us on what has happened and what's still to be done. Um, and please, as audience members, remember to use the questions on the virtual platform to submit to the panel. I'm now going to introduce the, uh, the moderator for this very first panel, that's David Lewis who is Senior Director at Securities of, of Securities Finance at FIS Global. So over to you, David, thank you. Many thanks, Kevin, and welcome back. It's good to see you back on, on the panel and um, moderating this, this event. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the first panel of the day, and um, one in which we hope to set the standard for, for others to follow. It's a very packed agenda and, um, and lots to talk about. So we're gonna get straight on. I've got an excellent panel with me. Um, they're all experts in our favourite subject of the past few years. As Kevin just mentioned, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, and it's not, not talking about Brexit, that's SFTR. As he said, my name is David Lewis. I work in the Securities, Derivatives and Tax Division of FIS with specific responsibility for securities finance market data products. And clearly there's some link there to SFTR. I'm delighted to be invited today to moderate today's session. And I'm going to start by asking our panel uh, today to introduce themselves, starting perhaps with Thomas, Adrian, Jonathan, and Joanne. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Hi, I'm Tom Bakikio. I work and represent at DTCC. I am the SFTR product manager, was responsible for oversight over the initiatives that cover across both European and the United Kingdom initiatives. And hello, I'm Adrian Dale. I'm Head of Regulation and Market Practice at ISLA, and the Market Practice bit covers uh, best practices and the digital projects that we're working on as well. And I'm Jonathan Lee. I'm a Senior Regulatory Reporting Specialist at, at Kaizen Reporting. Kaizen Reporting is a firm that provides quality assurance through regulatory testing in relation to all of the major G20 uh, transaction reporting regimes including SFTR. Um, hi everyone, I'm Joanne Salkeld and I'm Product Manager for our SFTR and our STP solutions um, at Market Access Post Trade. Great, thank you everybody. So uh, as Kevin said, we're, we're a little more than a year on from the target launch deadline of SFTR and a deadline that seemed to approach very fast to those of us who were working on SFTR and doing all the preparation for this new regulation and regime to come in. That date seems to be rapidly disappearing into the rear view mirror, but the rollout and implementation of SFTR is far from over. More changes are afoot, but I'm afraid the concerns um, still exist about timing and lack of certainty around certain issues to do with um, the implementation and the expectations around that data. And those things still challenge market participants. Um, all of which, of course, are keen to remain regulatory compliant. So let's have a little look back first, um, only spend a couple of minutes on that, but um, and then look forward to where um, we think this all might end. Adrian, I'm going to start with you because um, you, you take a, uh, an interesting position in this panel, being um, wearing a couple of hats, but I'm going to start with your ISLA hat. So I want you to represent market participants in their view here. I think it's fair to say that SFTR absorbs significant resources in the build-up to the first tranche of reporting going live. How has that played out for market participants so far? Thanks, David. Um, but to start with just summarising, though, what an enormous effort, what an enormous cost that's been put into it uh, by everyone. Um, obviously, market participants, but trade associations as well. Um, to, if we bring ourselves up to today, we can say it settled down somewhat, but there was uh, uh, an ISLA SFTR working group yesterday, very well attended. We've still got 300 regist uh, registrations to the working group, not that all of them turn up, of course, but 
the, you know, the conversation is still going on and the meetings are very regular as well. There's a steady flow of questions that come in, that come in as well, uh, as people are still struggling with some of the aspects, fields and the logic that, that's uh, part of SFTR. Um, it's very detailed and actually even just thinking about what Kevin said, if he was to join one of the working groups now, it's almost like a different language. You wouldn't understand some of the st stuff that people are talking about. And it's so it's pretty heavy going. And our meeting yesterday was, I think, about an hour and, an hour and three quarters. Um, so let's have a quick look at where we are today. I think that it's become a new normal. Um, it's a business cost. It's just accepted that this is what has to be done. Um, it's something else that has to be reconciled. It's something that has to be you know, worried over. At, in, and when I talk about that, I mean, if you make a change to something now in your uh, operating model, you have to think about the impact of it on SFTR as well. We've still got outstanding issues um, that were being discussed in, in working groups. There are logic traps as well that are being created by the validation rules that got mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you do this and this and this, then all of a sudden you have to do something that actually doesn't re uh, reflect reality. And then there's uh, possibly we're going to be talking about this a bit more, but there's the divergence now between the timing of the validation rules, which everyone's very concerned about. And there's more to come on there. Is that, is that, uh, does that sort of bring us up to where you want to be? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. There's, there's a couple of things that really um, jump out at me already from that. I mean, I love the phrase logic traps and having dug into SFTR in the early days, I know exactly what you're talking about. As many people on this panel and indeed in the audience, I hope, um, will will understand. Um, the thing, other thing that, that I'm going to take from that is 300 registrants on an hour and a three quarters. That's just one day. I mean, obviously, as you said, not not all appear, but let's say 100 did. That's 175 full-time employee hours spent just that one day. So if you think about the cost of the overall effort, um, some of which, of course, is perhaps not accounted for when you think about those FTE hours, um, it is huge. And um, Joe, as a, a regulatory reporting provider in this space, how do you think your clients have managed to navigate the obligations and the difficulties, so perhaps some of the things that Adrian just mentioned? Um, so I think preparation really was key uh, for most firms. Um, one of the main elements was obviously testing in advance. Um, at Market Access, we made sure that our SFTR solutions were ready for firms to test way ahead of the SFTR go live. Um, most firms obviously took full advantage of the extended testing period, which was a result of the pandemic, um, just to ensure readiness. Um, from experience of previous reg regulatory implementations, we obviously knew that one of the fundamentals of success was to ensure full participation in early end-to-end -end testing. Um, and also before go live, we worked with many of our clients, you know, we've already touched on this, obviously, or the operational aspect of this. We worked with many of our clients to ensure that they had um, defined processes in place, such as how they were due to generate and share UTIs with their counterparties, um, as well as how they would easily manage their exceptions. Um, and in addition to this as well, some firms made full use of the ability to delegate their reporting to their counterparty, which obviously is to make easier for matching at the trade repositories. Okay, some interesting stuff there, particularly to do it with regards to delegation, but the, the ongoing issues that people are, are still asking questions about, but testing, testing clearly key. And um, Tom, is that in line with your experiences or, or do you see anything different yeah i mean I, I mean luckily for us you know we have we have great experience building out trade repositories at dtcc i mean this is i think one you know close to 10 unique trade repositories including the derivatives world but again sftr did have its own challenges very similar to joan i think getting to uat and releasing a product early was critical to the success of the implementation at least the first go live we did have, uh, you know, I believe we opened it up back in August in 2019. That was our first release. And it was, again, this being the very first product, at least from an Amir or an ESMA perspective, looking at Amir, right? In Amir, it was a bit of a phase delivery. They don't support ISO, right? They have a different standards. There's CSV, there's FPML, at least from our side. But this was the very first product where the regulators actually you know, essentially required every submission to be constrained, confined into the constraints of an ISO 2002 schema. And that's something that really, they've implemented data quality standards directly into that schema to ensure that the data is accurate and complete. I think for us, 
too. I mean, really, it's been pedal to the metal since February 2019. We, the, you know, the, the the extension helped us at least deliver a bit more client facing functionality. Uh, you know, the extension from April to July. But once that happened, I mean, we jumped right into Brexit mode, and really, what was essentially an 18 month project, we had to deliver that in close to four months. And again our experience and our uh, building out trade repositories made it a bit easier for us to essentially uh, deliver that on time and hit those deadlines. The other thing too, uh, you know, the fund doesn't end and, you know, there is a scheme upgrade, which we'll be talking about a bit later and a new version of validation rules. And of course, what Adrian mentioned earlier, the divergence of the EU and UK uh, validations in terms of timeline. Yeah, we, we will definitely get to that. Um, that's something, as, as Adrian mentioned, mentioned came up yesterday, but it's, it's very topical, um, but it's going to be a big impact. Um, I'm going to pick up on, on what you said there about the schema um, and perhaps throw this over to Jonathan, because when they talk about the schema, the ISO 20022 um, set up, as you said, it's one of the first times that such a thing was mandated in by a regulator in this kind of space. And clearly that was um, to help everybody comply in a particularly um, defined way. I suppose that's a way of looking for quality in the data. Jonathan, you work for um, a quality assurance provider, I think is, is the right phrase to use, um, as opposed to, to what we might think as a, as a regulatory reporting provider. Um, so if you've been looking specifically at the quality of the data and that quality assurance angle, you must have a kind of an interesting perspective, particularly as perhaps you've, as many will know, you've moved from a market participant to that position. Um, what, what's your perspective of what's, how this has all played out? Thanks, thanks David. Um, I, I think it's it, it's fair to say that the validation rules, whilst you know in flux at, at present, they're still they still remain quite loose, and yet they're viewed by the regulators very much as a reliable benchmark. Unfortunately, reporting a valid uh, transaction or valid um, action is certainly no guarantee of the accuracy of that report. The vast majority of the reports that we test are valid, they pass the validation rules at the trade repository, but they are wrong in one or more of the details that's been reported. In terms of you know, how this is addressed, I, I do think that compliance concerns will certainly escalate considerably once the first fine is, is issued. But with a regulation that's trying to pick up on both um, sort of micro surveillance and macro systemic issues, Clearly, data quality is absolutely key and absolutely fundamental to the regulators being able to use this data for its intended purpose. And again, it's something that was mentioned earlier, but something that um, Richard Komoto of the ICMA has been uh, very, very keen to highlight. In terms of my experiences, certainly um, working for a quality assurance firm has been a real eye opener. You know, the, the industry is extremely broad and extremely diverse. Being large has certainly proven to be no guarantee that you have higher quality reporting than, than smaller, smaller counterparties. But it's certainly fair to say that some firms have been more diligent than others in terms of addressing those data quality concerns. I think for many, you know, there is a feeling that they've done enough. They're submitting their reports. The reports are being accepted by the trade repository. And... Um, you know, regulatory compliance is ultimately expensive. So, you know, the, there's certainly been a reluctance to do a lot more at this stage. But as I say, once the first fines start hitting the mat, I strongly suspect that uh, concerns will, will escalate considerably. So I think everybody would, would agree that regulatory compliance is expensive, but it's also pretty vital to um, being able to, to undertake your business, right? But um, Adrian, I've got I've got to bring you in here, right? Because this is the trade association. What are you doing? If 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 the if what Jonathan said, says is is right um, about the efforts being put in, and we need um, a greater quality. I mean, when, when SFGR was introduced, lots of people were thinking, okay, well, this is going to be a regulatory imperative to improve the data quality in all of the systems and all of the processes that the industry undertakes. And as an industry association, clearly you've got a view on that as a, as a broad perspective. But really, is it going to take fines to make that leap forward? How's that worked out for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was, I was quite, 
not shocked, but that's made me smile there, Jonathan. You're getting into fines in question one. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think we're there quite yet. And, you know, when we were having um, before before go live, some of the conversations that were being had with NCAs, uh, I think, actually, as there were some public ones, I think that you and I both attended as well, where they're explaining, obviously, you don't, you know, if someone's done something wrong, you don't immediately jump in with fines all over the place. Um, like some sort of cra crazed gunman, that's that, that may be a poor remark to make. Uh, actually, what would happen is, is you know, a much more a mature approach and that there would be a conversation between uh, a, a supervisory body and you know, the person who's sending something in to understand what that thing is. There's, a, there's all likelihood is that, that if one firm is doing something incorrect, there's possibly a bunch of other firms that are doing something incorrect. And I can think of several examples of that already. I was going to I was going to sort of come back to you know, the, the these the something that passes a validation rule but is still incorrect because there are also these situations where because things are being asked for that, that aren't naturally in in the sort of the host data environment where you know, where the data is coming from that things are being sort of mapped and, and put together and whenever you do data mapping in any system in any firm or on any data set there's always something that goes wrong and it's amazing when it, uh, in the, the conversations that have been over the just the past year on the on the digital projects and how much time is being spent people trying to figure out what the right data set is to use sorry i've got I've gone a bit off um off piece did you did you want me to, to answer the question or just or should i leave the remarks there <laughs> well no i think i think we're going to touch on quite a few of those things um as as we as we develop this um subject but i think that one of the key ones and, and it, it's important to, to identify here, I think, is the phrase that Jonathan used just then and you picked up on, which is valid but wrong. And mm. I think my, my concern there, I suppose, and this is a concern perhaps across the industry, is that you can pass the tests and you can send valid data in. But if you're not measuring something properly, you're not going to be able to manage it properly. So people who are making decisions on the data that they're getting are perhaps looking at things that are valid, but but wrong. So that, that's a big concern, I think. Um, there's lots of challenges in the way that the, the data has been gathered in terms of single versus dual reporting and stuff, and I don't necessarily want to unpick all that again. Um, but actually, Tom, if, if I can bring you in here, in terms of are there statistics that might back up some of the things that Jonathan says are concerns and Adrian has identified as issues perhaps in the way people are submitting data, or what, or what has DTCC seen in that regard? Yeah, so generally, generally the beginning of a, of a regulation, you know, data quality is going to be lacking, right? And over time, you'll see that data quality improves, more regulations come out, or business validation rules change that essentially enforce, you know, data quality standards or to, to, to a different level of it. But for us, right, uh, just going, playing on Jonathan's, uh, you know, compliant but not necessarily right. I mean, within our first week of reporting. We had an average of a 95% uh, acceptance rate, and right now it it hovers consistently between 98 and 99%. And again, all of these submissions are compliant, but you know, being a member, an active member of both the ICMA and ISLA working groups, you know, there are a lot of challenges in the business validation rules that don't necessarily make sense, or rather, they're not necessarily logical and workarounds or best practices. Do need to come up for it, and I believe there's one in there around LEI of the issuer, I, I believe the, maybe Adrian can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, the best guidance is just not report because there are a lot of issuer or a lot of LEIs that just don't, uh, uh, that don't have LEIs. And when we don't have an LEI, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pass the business validations rule and it's impossible to submit because it will always result in a rejection. So not reporting, is that really the right thing to do? Maybe not, but again, it were confined by the constraints of the business validations template. Another thing too, and I just want to touch on reconciliation uh, briefly, is that for rec there's so much time and effort being spent on reconciliation, ensuring that your pairing rates are there, all your trades are paired, all your trades are matched from a loan and collateral perspective. But what's really, I found very interesting looking at some of the data that we have, uh, the eligibility rates in both the EU and the UK in terms of what is eligible, what's not eligible, it's roughly 10% across the board. And there's so much time and effort, so much regulatory focus, there's heightened focus from uh, you know, uh, NCA and ESMA perspective on these pairing and matching rates for 10% of these trades. 
And if their focus is so much on that, you know, what, what, what are we looking at or what, what's the concern with the rest of the data, if the majority of the data that is being reported to them doesn't fall within the reconciliation uh, eligibility? Okay, um, that's really useful. In fact, it, and you've kind of answered what I'm now gonna throw randomly at the other three. Um, so you're off the hook for a minute. Um, we've had the first three questions in from the, from the audience, which is great. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix the first two together. Um, what are the top three things that three of you, uh, other than Tom, would suggest are the big things to hit in order to improve data quality? Who wants to go first? That stumped you for a minute, hasn't it? Um, uh, let, 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 me ju- let me just throw a few things in there. I'm sure John, okay. you'll, you'll probably have some other things. I mean, um, so one of the things I was going to mention uh, later on, perhaps, was things like prices and credit ratings, uh, FX rates, and trying to standardise those. There's an enormous amount of work that is actually being done on the LEI that, that uh, Thomas mentioned as well, uh, which is something that's it's not completely fixable, but it's something at least you can get your teeth into and have a, and have a go at. Um, uh, we'll talk about the stats perhaps later on, but um, there, there, there's some initial thoughts. I don't know, Jonathan, you probably, you could, sorry, you put your hand up there and I interrupted. I, um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Adrian. I, I, I think um, first and foremost, um, e- even a, a one-off exercise of having some independent testing will tell you a tremendous amount around the quality of your reporting. As I say, I think from a regulator perspective, there's been far too much emphasis, as, as Thomas has already mentioned, that a, a reconciled report is much more likely to be a correct report and therefore placing a lot of emphasis on a reconciliation process that doesn't account for many transactions. Now, you know, clearly there are many instances in which among those dual-sided reports, many of them are, are delegated reports. So straight away, there's, there's no benefit to be had from from the reconciliation process. Secondly, a lot of firms are using the same vendors for data enrichment. So if there's an issue with the data quality coming out of that vendor, then straight away, you know, this isn't gonna be picked up through the reconciliation process. So in order to tackle that, having um, some independent oversight, some independent testing will ensure that you're able to pick up on these, these issues. You're really able to challenge your vendors and turn around to them and say, look, you know, we have conclusive evidence here that you're populating these fields incorrectly. We, re- we retain the legal obligation to provide complete, accurate and, and timely reporting. Therefore, we need you to fix this. You know, that will certainly help a lot. I also think there's a tremendous number of efforts that need to be made continue- continually with both ESMA and the FCA. At the moment, we have far, far too many grey areas. There are far too many fields that are not clearly or tightly defined. I mean, I suppose to give to give an immediate immediate example, you're supposed to populate the uh, jurisdiction of the issuer of a security, but nowhere in the definition does it state whether this is supposed to be the jurisdiction of incorporation of the issuer or jurisdiction of the headquarters of the issuer. So there are you know many assumptions left left there, and. You know, very often the regulator's response to questions around, around these discrepancies and, and these um, grey areas has been counterparties should agree this amongst themselves. Clearly, you know, with, with parties submitting, you know, anywhere between, in, in some cases, you know, 10,000 and, and 100,000 or, or more activity messages per day, is clearly not a viable solution for them to, to negotiate amongst themselves as to how you know any one of the 155 fields should be populated, it, it's totally it's totally unworkable. Okay, I want to come, I want to come back to thoughts on regulators in a second. But Joe, can you, do you is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to jump in, I guess, from a, a vendor perspective. I think obviously um, we've, we've touched on the fact that obviously a lot of reference or instrument data issues, which are causing challenges amongst the reconciliation. So we at Market Access, you know, we're working hard with those, those uh, data providers to ensure that we've got a better coverage. Um, we see a lot of obviously of um, things raised by our clients and we want to work with our clients to make sure that those are addressed. But I also think touching back on um, the fact that obviously SFTR has had a huge impact on, on operations as well is the fact that these 
that I think obviously from previous experience of regulations, there's always going to be a ton of reconciliation breaks and we're not going to easily get away from those. Obviously the points that the, 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 uh, that those such as Jonathan and Thomas and um, Adrian have touched on will, will help, but I think we still have to have that um, piece in place that to, because obviously understanding large sets of data and the number of breaks that can be received is very difficult to interpret or manage. So having something and being ready to be able to manage that that that, sort of, that level of data is also key, I think. Sure. OK, thank you. Um, I think the way our markets moved on in the last you know, 25 years or so, as, as I've been around, um, it was automated uh, reconciliation contract compare kind of services have, are unrecognisable. They're, they're, they are a huge part of the way the ordinary part of the market functions. Um, I think that I suppose the breach of that getting into SFTR is, as, as Jonathan mentioned, all these fields that are not necessarily clearly defined and so on. Um, we have had a, an additional question just on the back of what we've just been saying. Um, and this is, I'm going to put to Adrian uh, with your regulatory hat on um, from for Isla's um, representation here. Do the regulators grasp the challenges and what are, that we've just been talking about and what are they doing about it? Uh, the short answer is, uh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I'm going to be more supportive of the regulators. I think they are aware of it, uh, not least because of the, we'll call it advocacy work or the, or the transparency of issues, uh, uh, the way it's being communicated to them. So there's, uh, there's several different avenues for that to happen. There's individual uh, firm conversations with whoever their supervising body is. Um, and, and we've been saying since before go live that if you think there's an issue, so the, 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 like the issue that Tom um, picked up on about LEI, if, if you don't have one, it's not going to pass a validation rule, so you don't report it. You have to log that stuff and then tell tell your supervising body that you're not able to report these things because the, the you know the template doesn't allow or the validation rules don't allow it to to be reported and so that openness and transparency is it i think is in the spirit of what the regulation wanted uh, was was looking for and you're trying to do the right thing and there's other examples i can think of as i say those words we're trying to do the right thing and sometimes you simply can't so there's that communication with the with the N, um, with the NCA. Then there's uh, the Q and A portal that you can have with ESMA, and there's equivalent type of processes you can uh, use with the FCA. And then there's uh, the, the sort of association level stuff where we gather together all the issues and, and we pump that out quite publicly. So yeah, absolutely, they're they're aware of it. I want to just like flip back to uh, for a second though to uh, if I could to the the point that was being made about um, validation of is it a branch or a head office that's being used and perhaps a best practice coming up saying you know being agreed by a market that you, you should use the head office if another market decides that they're going to have a different uh, a different one they're going to use the branch for instance when it a time when it comes down to the regulator they're going to be looking at what they think is sort of uniform data but actually it isn't. And that's you no, know, that's a very, very simplistic view on it because there are nuances about how firms do it, and they get themselves into their own logic traps uh, and echo chambers as well about why they should go in one direction or another. The ultimate, uh, uh, no, the ultimate uh, data set that you get, the person who's losing from that is the regulator who wants to have the transparency because now they're looking at a bunch of garbage. So it's in their interest for it to be as clear as possible. But there's a process you have to go through that you can't say well, if you every day you said oh that was wrong and i changed my mind about it how how are people going to build and then deliver something to that because it's quite a complex process uh, i think i think again you, you've touched on a, a dozen different points there all of, of which pointing in the same direction in terms of data quality um, data management the original if i'm if i'm right in saying so looking back at the financial stability board's transparency directive the original objective of that was to understand the broad capital and liquidity flows across different types of, of market participants globally and each jurisdiction then has to sit to in, introduce their own rules to interpret that um, i'm kind of blending in a, yes another question from the audience we've got a very active audience today which is fantastic um, in in terms of the data that esma uh, wanted to gather compared to the original transparency directive it's way off field you know it's, it's way more fields of data it's much greater frequency, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a bit, it's a bit of a landmine question that's arrived actually on screen, which is um, why do they all need all these fields? Wouldn't it be a lot better if they were a lot smaller, uh, a smaller list of fields? Well, I guess the obvious answer to that is yes. Um, the simpler it is, the less data fields, clearly it's gonna be 
um, uh, perhaps easier to reconcile and process, but the, they've asked for all of these fields for um, other reasons, which perhaps we won't touch on today, because that's all about where they might be going with future regulations and so on. Um, but in terms of their push at the moment, it's, it's talking about data quality. They're trying to improve the quality of what they're receiving. And what Adrian, you just kind of touched on that. Would it be um, an idea that they would entertain to reduce, perhaps bring back the scope? Because at the moment, early doors next year, they're going the other way. They're making it harder. Tom mentioned that just now. Um, Adrian, perhaps first, but Jonathan, you've got your hand up. So let's go to you next. On so on on data quality and what, what they're doing with it, you mean? Mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, because at the moment they're, they're kind of heading down a, a more difficult direction. The the kind of basis of the question that's just popped up is, wouldn't it be easier to perhaps withdraw a little bit, reduce the, the requirements, get that right, and then expand? There's there's any number of issues around that, not least the fact that the number of fields and uh, are sort of defined in 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 regulation in law, aren't they? So they're no, they're in the official journal. So it's not easy to to, to change the number of fields around. But then the, the process actually it was it was quite a, a usual sort of process. If you wanted to make a cake, you'd start off with you know one or two ingredients, and you realise that actually there are these dependencies, and it, it wouldn't be a cake unless you added some other things in. So that and they had you know the similar type of approach to the number of fields that, that we have today, which is why it grew to the, the you know the amount it did. There were some they had to have because of other other regulations, like you mentioned, and then because of that, you know, the other things have to go in there as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the cake that you end up with. So that's part of the reason. So it, you know, it was there was no there's no malice or anything like that. But at the same time, the data that they've got now is all of it being used. And I don't think that you know I think there's a, a good case, a good argument to be had about. We don't think it's all being used at the moment. We certainly we'd like to see more data coming out uh, uh, out of them. Um, but is it all being used? I'm not entirely sure if that was. Well. Yeah. And they're not going to reduce the number of fields. That's the answer to that. No, and perhaps there'll be some some relief to the fact it's not being used. Perhaps in anger at the moment for for other regulations or other uh, constrictions. But Jonathan, how about the, how about your cake? Oh. So I mean, I, I um, very vocally made the point in in front of the Financial Stability Board group of experts when they were agreeing the the original standards back in sort of 2013, 14, 15. And you know, one of the key points I repeatedly made was if around the uh, securities and collateral uh, and uh, collateral classification, you know, if you ask ten different banks, you'll get eight or nine different answers. And unfortunately, sure enough, that that that's coming to fruition. I, I think for the regulators, in terms of the low hanging fruit, probably less emphasis on the reconciliations and more emphasis on fairly blatant underreporting. So where you have something that should, um, based on the reporting counterparty and the other counterparty, be a dual-sided report, and yet you're only seeing any evidence of a, of a single-side reporting, then clearly you can haul up the, the counterparty who isn't reporting. And secondly, where you have um, the, the same um, details, the same classifications, being uh, reported over a period for, for say the same securities and yet there is there are discrepancies and differences clearly in many cases both answers cannot be correct and therefore one of the answers is wrong in terms of how this is is sort of practically and, and pragmatically addressed I agree that certainly no, not only having so many of the requirements written into the level one the original regulation, but also many of the, the validation rule requirements and the reconcilable fields being written into the regulatory technical standards or the, or the level two has certainly been extremely unhelpful. But I think one way around it is, and, and many of the national competent authorities themselves will quite openly admit that there are many of the fields that they simply disregard simply because the data quality is immediately, you know, it's immediately apparent that the data quality is so low. But in terms of how to get around that, if there is potential an opportunity to possibly, um, you know, if you cannot physically remove the fields, then certainly remove them from the reconciliation if there's any means in which to do that, or alternatively make them, you know, op um, optional and essentially informational only. I do think that ultimately, uh, regulators in particular, but the industry as a whole should really be moving much more towards uh, golden data sources. 
and not reliant upon a whole sort of plethora of different vendors to provide different responses and different answers to many fields which are exclusively for SFTR use. These are not used by any of the industry. And when you look at the number of reporting counterparties who are purchasing a large amount of data enrichment in order to uh, populate and submit their reports to the trade repository, it's extremely telling that this data has absolutely no use within the firms whatsoever and is not representative of how they manage their risks. So I, I think you know those, those are the key lessons to be learned and to continue to apply uh, pressure on, on ESMA and on the FCA to start to essentially loosen off some of the rules around some of these fields if they're not able to remove them. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Pretty damning, uh, damning assessment, I have to say, um, in, in terms of where it's going and so on. But the and, and we'll, I want to do. I do want to touch on that divergence of ESMA and FCA and how that might play out. But let, I, I also want to give Joe and Tom um, some time to respond to some of the things that have been said already. Um, you've, I, I'm going to pick up on one of them. The in phrases you've just used, blatant underreporting. Um, you're clearly desperate to, to get somebody fined at some point. But it's um, Joe and Tom. Do you do you have? Uh, obviously, you. I'm thinking about statistics in your own reporting and your own processes rather than um, uh, details, perhaps. But are you seeing some of these things in the reporting that you're processing in terms of a risk of underreporting? Um, we'll, we'll we'll leave the kind of applicability of fields later and some of the other comments, but we we'll hopefully get to. Joe. Yeah, I think we um, we touched on it earlier, really, around the uh, counterparty and instrument data. Um, uh, again, so from our perspective as a vendor, um, firms are raising those issues with us based on their uh, reconciliation breaks. Um, and we are obviously working with the data suppliers for better instrument data quality, particularly across the industry. Um, from our perspective, our aim is really to establish best practices across the industry to support more complete, accurate and timely reporting. Um, and just obviously touch on the gaps that we obviously addressed on the multiple gaps that are currently you know, out there outstanding with the regulation itself. It's obviously important that the industry bodies continue to work with the market to understand those gaps in the data quality, um, as well as the industry landscape. Um, and to obviously engage with ESMA and the FCA on those just as obviously Jonathan touched on. Um, and I think as well, as we've already alluded to, um, an example of obviously um, engaging with ESMA, et cetera, on the industry landscape was the example of, of delegated reporting, which may perhaps obviously have a lot of hidden data issues behind that are masked behind delegated reporting itself. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Tom, anything to add to that in terms of your experiences? Yeah, so what's interesting, I mean, there are some fundamental issues with reconciliation and we're seeing the same, you know, five to 10 fields that are the highest amount of breaks across all the products, you know, consistently from month to month. And those are fields that, you know, we share with, with, our, with our clients. And that's something that, you know, doesn't seem to be getting better in terms of if these same five fields, same five to 10 fields are still breaking, right? That's something that I think you're gonna have to start focusing on. But again, going back to the fundamental issues, uh, with reconciliation, I mean, there's T plus T plus one reporting, right? And firms submitting variation margin daily, it's never going to line up. If one firm submitting on T, another firm submitting on T plus one. I think a lot of the rules and the discussions that they're having right now for a mere refit is going to ultimately transcend into the foundation of what SFTR is going to be uh, in the future when this SFTR rewrite inevitably hits. I think, uh, again, the journey generally starts out lacking and we're very, you know, still pretty, pretty immature in terms of where we are uh, with, I mean, Amir has been going on for quite some time now. They've added new fields. They removed some fields. I feel like there's only going to be more changes and ultimately it's going to just create more opportunity for those uh, firms, especially vendors uh, in terms of data quality services they can provide. ESMA has been, Helpful though, they are willing to listen. They offer periodically Q and A's, which address some more of the complex questions. They offer other clarifications 
And really, it's a direct result of industry engagement. And I will say TR influence as well as we do have a, a channel directly to them in forms of roundtables and just contacts in general. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, this engagement is just going to result in constant change and more releases, more costs, and like I mentioned earlier, more, more opportunity. Thanks, Tom. Um, you, you, whether purposely or not teed up um, Adrian and Jonathan um, for, some, for some analysis here, right? I'm going to come to you, Jonathan, in a second. We'll talk about the QA comments that Tom just made. Um, but Adrian, um, with your, your regulatory hat on, um, your, your other ISLA hat, um, I want to talk a little bit about reg, reg, regulation in terms of reg tech um, and this lovely phrase that tries to make regulation sound cool um, in the same kind of stable as fintech or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, that response to, um, or reg tech is, is a new area of services, right? It's a new area of services um, that is out there to arguably improve market data quality. Um, is this just... Um, is this a measure, or is, this, is that response rather a measure of the industry's inabilities? Are these structural weaknesses in our industry um, that keep us from keeping accurate records? Uh, yes, there are. I mean, all these conversations are, are pointing in the same direction. And the, the, I think that we're actually come to, SFTR has actually shown us that we've come to this sort of transition point or tipping point of recognizing the fact that there wasn't sufficient uh, you know, collaboration, uh, there weren't sufficient standards around, uh, about, around how the market operated uh, and how difficult it was to actually pull out some standard data uh, you know, to report to a regulator to say what your market was doing. So I think that it's shown that uh, something needs to be done about that, which is, um, I'm sorry, uh, David, I'm not entirely sure which question we're on. I got a bit lost there. Um, so I'm just going to talk generally about it. Um, I think we've, so we've got to this tipping point, and I think that what needs to happen is we have to we have to actually do what um, perhaps one of you were part of the conversation where it initially happened. I understand there was a conversation where the regulator said to uh, said to the industry industries, "What have you got that you can show us about how you know, how your market operates?" And I think that the ALD was put in front of them, the agency lending disclosure, which is absolutely not fit for purpose in Europe, certainly. Uh, and, and it immediately highlighted the fact that, that one counterparty doesn't know who the other counterparty is until a bit after it perhaps is settled even, uh, actually a settlement date plus one uh, using ALD, which is actually a, a horrific way to, uh, to represent the, your, your industry or market. Uh, you know, even a five-year-old would say, why are you doing it like that? So let's, so let's, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, we're not in a great state from that perspective. Uh, SFTR has shown us, uh, has, has taught us this great lesson. The, so regulations are cool from that perspective, that they're, that they're doing something. They're also freeing up budget to, you know, to, uh, to be able to do the reporting in the first place. But they've shown us that we, that we need to go a bit further. And there's also, there's a warning, I think, that there's, uh, that's inside the, the experience of SFTR is how much did that cost you? How much was the resource and the fact that you still, still don't have clarity on it? And it's not working from a perspective based on those comments today of how the regulator is doing it and how they're lining up that process of there's something I want and let's talk about it and let's agree what it is, clarify, and then you can build it. That process hasn't worked very well. Back to an original comment earlier on rather from, from Joe about testing. Testing was good because we had COVID. It gave us the space to be able to do it, which is also, that's not a great, great thing. So. The other lesson we need to pick up then is if it's going to cost that much each time they ask for something, then we need to be prepared for it. And we should actually be, have a way of expressing our industry the correct way and a, and a standard. And so the next time this comes up, because there's going to be another one, and we think about something like ESG, for instance, where it's already being spoken about how you're going to be transparent that you are an ESG person and, and you know, then your measure of ESG uh, is, is what you say it is on, on, your, uh, uh, on the front of your website. That, that level of transparency is going to be even more, I would imagine, than SFTR. It's going to be even more complicated because of the different measures and the taxonomy around it. So we need to get ourselves set up in the next, actually, one to two years. We need to have a standard set before ESG starts being our, um, transparency gets, gets asked of us. And then you've got other things like the DAC regulation as well. Uh, we're all pushing in that same direction. 
a mere refit could might might sort of get uh, get the uh, get the moving in the right direction as well because if it's profound change and the SFTR refit when it comes perhaps next year that profound change might be the actual catalyst of coming up with the standard and I think that that's where we need to be heading. I'm a, a big proponent of C, a CDM of course, which perhaps we'll talk about in a second. I, I, I'm not sure we're going to have time for that, but but sorry, but we, we, we will have a go. Um, no, there's 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 an awful lot there that that. Um, we could spend hours unpicking in terms of the, the impact of this, but I'm going to join up a couple of threads from, from Joe and Tom in what you've said, in the sense of the, the, the data benchmarking, the um, best practices, having consolidated data in terms of the instruments and the, um, the reference data, I guess, a couple of comments being made today in terms of the, the quality from different providers um, of what we would as you said, Adrian, a five-year-old might think, well, of course, a, a security is a security, isn't it? You know, it's got the same security code, the NLEI is going to be the same, all that kind of thing that you would naturally expect. Um, best practice is something clearly ISLA uh, is, is in, involved in, right, where there's a lot of best practice stuff going out there. And Jonathan mentioned that when we're talking about um, getting the, the definition of fields. And if you can all agree what you should be doing, um, a lot of the early work in SFTR analysis, of course, covered those. Um, there is a question here, is, is, Asla, excuse me, is ISLA actively collating and presenting and highlighting and putting all this in front of the regulator um, kind of aggressively enough? And that question comes from someone called Andy Dyson. Um, uh, I, I don't, that's obviously not. Uh, this is a quick answer. I it might be. Um, I'm not seeing the names of the people who are submitting these questions, but I think without being a, a kind of leading question, clearly you are right in front of it of ESMA's face and the FCA, of course, uh, as part of your position. Yeah, I'll, sorry, I'll make it quick this time. So we actually spoke about it in the working group yesterday as well. Uh, what I plan to do is there is a list. Uh, obviously, we've been keeping it uh, as things have come up. That list needs to be published uh, you know, to, to all the NCAs, to the FCA, to ESMA. Uh, and so everyone's completely aware of what the issues are, the challenges for the industry. And I think that we should explain, you know, that here's an issue. This is the reason it's an issue. And this is the, the, the sort of implication of the whole thing. But we'll be going through that in the next working group to sort of preempt the review that's obviously going to be happening next year, or I hope it is going to be happening next year. Yeah, there's, there's clearly a whole raft of things coming in as you mentioned. Jonathan, let's come to you. Um, you were talking earlier about um, some of the solutions and ideas you, you come up with or, or, or the QA can assist. Given some of the, some of the comments and of the difficulties we're talking about here, what are the things that you would um, uh, recommend? And um, as a data provider myself, I understand how difficult it is to gather data from market participants that is consistent and looks like each other. What are the things that you think people can do um, that would improve that process. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I, I think, uh, sort of, for, first and foremost, that you know, the, um, the the step for firms to have to report to a trade repository was a significant step forward. In terms of the data that we review, overwhelmingly, we we find that um, our accuracy testing is actually far more effective than a reconciliation process. And we take the data directly from the trade repository. So we're providing a retrospective look at what has actually physically hit the trade repository over the course of the last month or the last quarter, and then performing in the region of 600 uh, tests above and beyond the validation rules on that data to establish whether it's not only valid, which should already have been established, but it is in, is in fact correct. In terms of how um, the, the sort of the whole uh, reg tech industry is really able to step in here, I mean, it's fair to say that, you know, post financial crisis, banks and other financial firms are having to throw huge amounts of money at regulatory reporting, and they very much sort of maintain sort of Fort Knox type data centers. As um, interest rates fell, margins were compressed, and firms were looking and, you know, they, they essentially came off the radar to some extent in terms of the, uh, the regulatory uh, scrutiny they were under, that it's fair to say that firms have been looking to cut costs. And one of the key ways of doing that has been to deploy the likes of, of reg tech firms who've come in with you know, cloud technology, 
much, much higher data standards than ever before, particularly standards like ISO 27001 that really ensure that your data is absolutely as Fort Knox secure within a, uh, within a vendor as it is uh, within your, your own uh, four walls. Such that, you know, with many of these firms um, staffed by ex-regulators and um, other highly experienced regulatory reporting specialists, and they're able to provide a great deal of, of market expertise, essentially all of the Q QA services that firms were trying to perform independently in-house, but with um, greatly improved economies of scale in the sense that we're not just performing this for one firm, we're performing this for you know, over 100 firms, such that we're really able to industrialize the entire QA process. It's still very much a handheld uh, type event. It isn't a case of giving the, the client a piece of software and them running away with it. You know, we, we do have, um, you know, quite um, detailed discussions throughout the, the entire process. But nevertheless, there's not only a, a great deal of um, greater value add in terms of the, you know, the, the actionable um, items that we, we give back to the client, but also they're able to achieve a, a much, much higher standard of control at a much lower price than if they were to do it themselves. Okay, um, thank you for that, Jonathan. I, I feel obliged to say other reporting companies are available after yeah. that. But um, Joe and Tom, I'm, I, I wanna bring this over to you now because cost is a big thing, right? Um, Jonathan mentioned it, I think Adrian mentioned it as well just now. Um, the market's under a little bit of pressure, margins are, are, are squeezed costs are going up. Reporting for SFTR is a massive overhead. We mentioned costs right at the start of this conversation. But is there um, a benefit? I mean, obviously, we can see benefits for being regulatory compliant and getting on with your business. But a lot of this data must have spin-offs. There must be a value in delivering this data and getting something out of it. Is there something you could um, describe as part of your service, without, I'm not necessarily looking for advertorial here, but as part of your service that says, do you know what, this is a good thing for the industry. Is there something you could kind of brush up on that, Joe, perhaps? I think, um, yeah, so uh, as of from, I guess, from vendor, vendor perspective, um, obviously at, at Market Access, we've actually got 30 years worth of, of regulatory experience that we can bring to the table. Um, which I think is one is one key factor. Obviously, having the, the regulatory experience and the knowledge um, is is one thing. Um, but our solutions effectively um, are all in one place, um, and it, obviously, it's it's one interface that firms can, can use for multiple uh, regulatory reporting obligations. Um, so, I guess the other thing as well as a vendor, we have a global client base um, that's obviously um, impacted by disparate timings or, or regulatory timings. Um, so obviously being able to accommodate that global client base is one thing that we must do. Um, and I think just going, throwing back to the regulatory diet or at least the temporary regulatory divergence between SFTR, EU and UK, that's due to happen, obviously uh, the EU check validation changes will take place on the 31st of January, 2022. The UK will be on the um, 14th of April, 2022. Um, it's our prerogative to make sure that we can accommodate those, um, whereas obviously it's been highlighted by some firms that due to the technical, to obviously technical constraints, um, they're unable to meet their reporting obligations as a result of that. So that's something, obviously one thing, another thing that we are able to accommodate as a vendor. Thank, thanks, Joe. Tom? I alluded, uh, I alluded to this earlier. I mean, a lot of this is, and all this change is creating massive, massive opportunity. Uh, and for us, just based on the, saw, the slim margins, you know, it's apparent that this is going to be a very largely volume-based business model in order to succeed and, and remain successful. Uh, a lot of vendors, right, uh, or a lot of firms may not necessarily be able to report uh, using ISO 2022 and would prefer things in CSV, prefer their reports, prefer to submit in CSV. I mean, there's a lot of services, a lot of XML trans transformation services, and that's something, you know, where we not outside of our TR, services, we do offer uh, a report hub service, which essentially is that exact service uh, that'll help firms report 
uh, properly a report in ISO 20022. And, and you know, it's not just that too, there's there's more than that. I mean, being a global company too, there's something that's gonna be extended to all of our uh, all of our trade uh, trade repositories as well and all the jurisdictions that we do support. But again, uh, you know, we, we have a massive amount of data and that is something that we are looking to capitalize on in terms of data analytics, data, any other types of data quality issues. And again, helping out uh, any pre-reporting validation services as well. Okay, um, Jonathan and Aja, you've both, you both had your hands up. Jonathan first, I think. Um, I am aware of time. We've got less than five minutes this panel to go. It seems to have shot past the, the hour very quickly. Um, and I do want to touch on the FCA and the ESMA divergence because it's come up on multiple questions on the panel, uh, on the, from the audience, and we've touched on a few times, but just 30 seconds each, Jonathan and Aging, before we touch on that. Sure. I, I think that um, working towards straight through processing is absolutely key. I mean, I come from an operations background. So if firms are able to, um, you know, if SFTR reporting is driven by firms' own data, their own credit assessments, pricing, interest rates and fees, and the collateral classification data, et cetera, is again the firm's own data and it is correct, then there's a great deal more scope for there to be far fewer manual touch points on transactions, get much closer to 100% settlement efficiency, and therefore be able to deliver broader benefits across the firm. So, yeah, I just wanted to address the, the, the point about cost, um, because I, I don't think the regulation actually should be a cost at all. Um, I'm mindful of, and at the moment it's cost not only for the markets, uh, market participants, but also a cost for the regulators as well. It costs them billions to collect the data that they have to at the moment. And then we all go through this, what, uh, you asked for that, but what does that actually mean? That old dynamic of, uh, okay, I, I want to supervise you, give me all this stuff. And, and it, that being misaligned with how the actual market works, I think that, that that whole dynamic needs to be changed and flipped on its head. We actually need to get to the point where the market can express, it. I said this earlier, the market expresses itself properly and the regulator takes the data that they want. And if they change their mind about what they want or they want less or more fields, they can change their mind and it has no impact on the market whatsoever because we just carry on doing what we're doing because we've got a market standard of how we express uh, how we operate. So those extra bits of data that you need to have, if the regulator wants that, then there are vendor solutions or they can go get it themselves. And also having that standard allows you to have the plug and play. So you get those fantastic services that vendors offer, centers of excellence, economies of scale, and all those sort of things you can have. If you could just plug and play, then you could also, you could always have a uh, compare the market type of thing. And you could create mm. through modularization the type of, uh, of firm service product that you wanted. Sure. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm going to keep it with you. Um, I've got a very firm eye on the clock. Just give us a few, few words on the... Um, divergence of the FCA and ESMA in terms of the timing and the impact it might have on the industry? So we have written a joint letter uh, with ICMA to, uh, to ask uh, you know, to, to align the, uh, the dates a bit better uh, for the EU, to, for ESMA to move back to April. Uh, that was rejected based on the fact that, they, that uh, you know, the process that they've gone through, uh, they had already given you know, sufficient notice about when it was supposed to be happening. Uh, I, I don't suppose, I mean, there's, there are more meetings to, to, uh, to be had. And in the meeting we had yesterday, and I don't mind speaking publicly about that because it's going to be you know, minutes and everyone else will be talking about it. So what we'll do is we'll, I think we should be responding back to say, fair enough if that's the way it is, but then here are all the issues that are caused from that. So there, there should be an understanding of you know, the repercussions of, of, of divergence. At the same time, let's be pragmatic about it. There's probably going to be more of this because it's just the nature of, of having you know, two jurisdictions who are you know, do their own thing. So, of course, these types of things are going to happen more and more. And so, I think that may be played out as other jurisdictions come on board and implement their transparency directive. Um, I'm going to, again, one eye on the time, we're going to get cut off any minute now. So I'm going to ask you each for perhaps some closing remarks. There's so much we've covered today and so much left unsaid as well. Um, Jonathan, you had your hand up. Do you want to kick off? Yeah, I was just going to mention that I, I think the FCA is absolutely right to harmonise, but they should syn synchronise it as well. That, that's very key. In terms of uh, closing comments, I think that, as I say, firms will gain a great deal from providing, uh, from receiving some, some independent uh, testing of, of their reporting. 
and you know, not assume that the best place to do all quality assurance is in-house? In sure. Jo? Um, I think as with all regulation, obviously SFTR has certainly been challenging and a bumpy ride. Um, regulatory scrutiny is probably not going to go away anytime soon, um, particularly as we're seeing disparate regulations. Um, so perhaps we should wait with bated breath for tighter regulation and I guess more global regulatory adoption. Thank you. And Tom? Yeah, I just want to say two things on, the, on that piece. I think regulatory divergence, you know, and, and the political environment, I think that's something we just have to get used to and really and really plan for. I think there's going to be more costs associated with that. I mean, that's something we've been planning for in our mere business in terms of Brexit since 2018. But uh, just going back to the timeline and the and the rejection of the extension letter, I think there's a fine balance just needs to be struck here. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, there's always a deadline. There's always going to be a request to extend, and that's something that we just need to have uh, bilateral discussions in terms of agreeing on what you know they they by law they have a six month window, but you know does that six month really mean six months? You know we're still going through clarifications. Does that need to be brought forward to nine months? You know that's something. That, again, there's many ways to skin a cat. I don't really know what the best way forward is, but it's obvious and apparent that that timeline needs to extend. I will say from DTCC's perspective, though, you know we are committed to to the long game. We're here to service regulatory needs and long term goals of our clients. We're actively engaged in both ISLA and ICMA in terms of better understand the challenges faced by the industry to help better serve everyone's needs. And that's something that we really take okay. pride on in being part of a, uh, being a utility to the industry. Well, I think that goes for everybody on, on, the, on the panel in terms of their position as either providers or, or industry bodies. So um, Kevin's popped up, so I think we're gonna get cut off in a second, but um, allow me just a few seconds to highlight some of the, the key phrases I've put down, logic traps, that's a new one, I'm going to use that somewhere I can. Um, this is definitely a landmark regulation and a change in the way that security finance industry has to com uh, communicate with its regulators. Um, there are fines coming, they're going to dropping on your doormat anytime soon, um, if Jonathan has his way. And some of it's about cost, but some of it's about benefit, and there's lots more work to do. Thank you very much, panel. It's been an excellent kickoff to the symposium. And I'll hand you back to Kevin. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Well, I'd just like Thanks, to, uh, well, thank you, David, for keeping us more or less on time. It struck me as we got towards the end of that panel and you were wrapping up and likely to go over by one or two minutes that someone should create a uh, a time trading system for tra trading time at uh, conferences. But that, that was a really, really good um, really good first start to the day, I think. And so I'd just like to thank the panel. I think we're going to have a short break for a minute or two, and then we're going to be straight back uh, with the next session, which is called All Settled for CSDR. Thank you.